Good evening and welcome to Pace IT's session on CompTIA Network Plus Exam N10-005. Tonight's webinar we will be covering exam objectives 2.2 and 2.3. I should introduce myself. My name is Brian Farrell, and I am an instructor for Peace IT and Edmonds Community College. And there you can see my some of my industry certifications and some of my background. Ah, good evening, Andrew. There we go. And with that, let's go ahead and jump into the topics for tonight. So we're going to start with exam obje objective 2.2, which is installing and configuring a wireless network. So you're going to get my take on this obje exam objective this evening. And where do we start? Well, we start with your configuration considerations. In most cases, if you're dealing with a small office, home office wireless network, you're probably going to go down to your local electronics store and buy a wireless access point, open it up, plug it into your wired network or to your router, turn it on, and you're going to go. You're going to use the defaults. That's because it's easy, uh, it's simple, it's easy, but it's also very much unsecure. So one of the first things that you need to do if you decide that you want to secure your network is you need to decide what you're going to do about your SSID, your service set identifier. That is your network's name. As a general rule, most consumer grade wireless access points are set to broadcast their SSIDs in the clear. <coughs> But you do have the option of hiding it. A lot of people think that when they hide it that it's not broadcasting. That's not true. The SSID is still being broadcast. It's just that the casual user can't see it. Uh, the way wireless works, the WAP has to broadcast the SSID in order for those who are allowed to connect to it to be able to connect to it. So you can hide it or you can leave it in the clear. That's up to you. As a general rule, I leave mine in the clear, but I do change my defaults. Um, another thing that you want to consider is when you're establishing your SSID, uh, don't don't name it after yourself. Don't don't say like the Jones Family Wireless Network. Uh, and why is that? Well because you're just kind of broadcasting whose network you are and people who are who want to break into it now know your last name if that's what you do. As a general rule, you want to make it something generic but something that you will remember. The other thing that you need to consider when you're doing when you're purchasing your WAP is compatibility. Uh, hopefully you're not buying anything that's 802.11a anymore. Uh, that's because it's not compatible really with any other standard. Kind of, sort of. Uh, yeah, actually it's not, not compatible with any other standard. The chances are you're going to, well, if you go with an 802.11b, uh, you can work with a G and an N, or you can work with an NG and A, or NG and B. Uh, those all work, well, B and G both work on the 2.4 gigahertz frequency band, frequency, which I will be getting here in a moment. N works on both um, and works on both the 2.4 and the 5 gigahertz frequencies. And Andrew, yes, that is the physical hardware. That's that's the that is the device that actually has the radio transmitter and receiver to the wireless access point. 
And in most cases, when you buy those, you would, because you're setting up a wireless network at home, you would plug it into either your cable modem or your DSL uh, router. Now, coming out now, actually it's been certified uh, by the IEEE is 802.11ac, which happens to be backwards compatible with both B, G, and N, and it works on almost strictly on the 5 gigahertz frequency. Uh, by the way, I would recommend using an, an 802.11n or an 802.11ac wireless access point, just because they have the most uh, longevity at this point in time. So let's move on. We were talking about frequencies. Well, let's talk about frequencies. So here they are. 802.11a works on the 5 gigahertz frequency band, and it uses OFDM as its modulation. Um, one second here. That is orthogonal Frequency division multiplexing. That and that's how it kind of splits stuff up to put it onto the frequency. Uh, the other 802.11b uses 2.4 2 gigahertz frequency, and it uses DSS, which is direct sequence spread uh, direct sequence spread spectrum. I can spit it out. Um, 802.11g uh, 802.11g is on both the 2.4 and the 5 gigahertz frequency. And 802.11 uses both the 2.4 and the 5 gigahertz. And it uses OFDM. And 802.11ac uses the 5 gigahertz on with OFDM. Now, I've been throwing out a lot of acronyms to you. Part of what part of what's occurring or happening is OFDM is how the the frequencies are are split up, the channels and whatnot, and also how the signal is modulated to the carrier wave. It gets a little bit technical, sorry, uh, but that's the way it is. When you're working on the 2.4 gigahertz frequency, there are 11 standard channels here in the United States. They're channels 1 through 11. And most of them overlap. You only have three channels that don't overlap. Channel 1, channel 6, and channel 11 do not overlap. And that's important to remember. If you're living in an apartment, and you're using channel 6 on the 2.4 gigahertz frequency, and your next door neighbor is using channel 6 on his 2.4 gigahertz wireless access point, you may experience problems. Even if you're not using the same network, your signals still may be clashing because they are on the exact same radio frequency. So if you're experiencing periodic slowdowns and you're using equipment that uses the 2.4 gigahertz frequency, try switching channels first, first and foremost. A lot of the times what you had was you had a channel conflict and that will uh, improve the performance. Now if you're using the five equipment that uses the 5 gigahertz frequency, 
that offers 23 non-overlapping channels. So the channels don't overlap. Uh, it's not much, not much of a risk anymore. Also, a lot of the equipment that uses the 5 gigahertz frequency will channel um, shift. That means when you fire it up, it'll select a channel. And if it notices that there's a lot of traffic on that channel, it will switch to a different channel. Awesome feature. Awesome feature. One second here. I'm <coughs> sorry about that. Um, yeah, let's move on. Okay, if I can get to the other slide. There we go. So one of the things that one of the things that I'll tell you is that electronics companies are in the business of selling electronics and if their equipment is difficult to set up, uh people won't buy it. So by default, most consumer grade wireless access points do not come with security enabled. Or if they do, they come with well known defaults. And what do I mean by that? You want to find out how what the administrative password is for say a a, a, a Netgear wireless router or wireless access point? Type it into Google and, and you'll find some well-known default uh, usernames and passwords. Same things works for security. So the first thing that you should do is you should change the defaults and enable in security. Security. Uh, and part of that is enabling encryption. Uh, all, I hope all of you are using equipment that's newer than 2003 because prior to 2003 the best you could get was what was called wired equivalent privacy and guess what that's not not so much WEP that's also called WEP WEP has been broken for a long time uh, it's not very safe people think they're safe well it's better than nothing but it can be broken in minutes uh, after WEP, WEP, came w, WPA, which is Wireless Protected Access. And the first version of WPA came out in 2003, and it came with TKIP, T-K-I-P, Temporal Key. Ah, now I can't remember the rest of it. I knew I should have written it down. Um, but that was kind of as a stopgap measure. Uh, w, WPA, TKIP, was compatible with pre-2003 wireless access points. So it was kind of a stopgap until WPA2 came out. And when WPA2 came out, it came out with an encryption standard that was called AES, Advanced Encryption Standard, which is a symmetrical encryption program. Uh, it is the standard that we still use to this date. That, by the way, WPA2 came out in 2004. We're still using it to this day. It is still harder than heck to break, uh, but just so you're aware, it can be broken. It is just difficult. Moving on, some other hardware considerations is where are you going to place your wireless access point? Well, a lot of that depends. Are you in a single or multiple access point environment? In most cases, you're going to be in a single access point environment, but if you're in a double or triple, you need to do some planning so that you have minimal signal overlap. Uh, but if you're in a single wireless access point environment, the best place to put your WAP is right in the middle of your coverage area. That will give you the best coverage. But in those situations, you tend to have a problem. Uh, for most of us, 
the center of our wireless environment happens to be right in the middle of everything where there's no place to plug in. And you don't have a cabled connection to your router. Uh, if you're in an office environment and you're lucky, you can run your Ethernet cable from your router or from your uh, patch panel to up through the fault ceiling and you can mount your wireless access point onto the ceiling and you'll be good there. But if you're in a home, eh, that doesn't work so well. So now you got to move your wireless access point to, out to an edge, which has its own problems. And I'll get to that here. Well, actually, now is as good as any. So if you've got your wireless access point on the exterior edge of your building because that's where you've got power and that's where you've got cabling, guess what? Your wireless signal is leaving your building. Uh, that's not too bad if it's going out into your backyard. You know, you can be out on your patio, use your wireless, yada, yada, yada. But if it's on the front of your house or in an apartment complex, um, you're shooting it out into the driveway, into the parking lot. And it can be seen by people. Even if you hide your SSID, it can still be seen with some special software. And if it can be seen, given enough time, it can be cracked. Um, so you want to be careful with how you do it and where you put your wireless access points. It's not a bad idea after you set it up to actually walk around with your laptop and check your signal strength. Most wireless access points do give you the ability to adjust the power output of the radio so you can fine tune your coverage area. As a general rule, you can actually turn down the power output a little bit, shorten up to your coverage area, make yourself more secure. Now, all consumer grade wireless access points come with omnidirectional type antennas, which are also called straight wire or dipole antennas. And what they do is they just kind of send it out in a, um, in a circle. It's an even spread. That works well for most of us, but in some cases that doesn't work so well. What happens if you want to put uh, You've got a barbecue out back, out towards your back fence line. You want to have wireless out there. and But you don't want to give wireless to your neighbors necessarily. How do you get it there? Well, you could use a directional antenna. Now, directional antennas help allow you to kind of steer your coverage. You're still going to have some leakage, but you can kind of narrow it down a little bit. And the types of directional antennas that are out there are parabolic dish or Yagi antennas. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, a Yagi antenna, um, most of us are, well, those of us of a certain age are kind of familiar with those because they look like the old PV antennas that people used to have on top of their houses. And why is that? Well, because those are actually Yagi antennas. But they can be used to steer radio frequency signals. So how do you set up the wireless network in a home? Like I said, you buy the wireless access point, you take it home, you plug it into your your either your cable modem or your DSL, you power it up. Well of course you're reading the documentation. You plug your you actually plug your equipment into it, your computer or laptop, you change the defaults, you establish your security, you unplug your computer from it, you put your wireless access point where you want it, and now you log on. Piece of cake. Uh, most of us have done it. Uh, hopefully most of us have done it and changed the defaults. So now let's move on to exam objective 2.3. And this objective deals with the purpose and properties of DHCP. Now this works for both wired and wireless networks. So let's talk about DHCP. 
So the first thing is, is how does my computer know what its internet protocol configuration is? How does it know what its IP address is and everything else? Well, more than likely, that's because it's received its IP configuration from a dynamic host configuration protocol server. It's received it from a DHCP server. Now, some of you be, may be scratching your head. I didn't know I had a server. Eh, you do, but it's probably not a very big server. Um, almost all routers and DSL modems, so cable routers or cable modems and DSL routers have DHCP servers built into them, just in case you didn't know that. So not only did that server give your PC its IP address and subnet mask, but it also told the PC or Mac or whatever it is that you've got where the default gateway is and how to contact a, a domain naming service server. Uh, I have a whole session on DNS. I'm not going to get into that at the moment. The default gateway, by the way, is your door to the outside world. And you need to know that. Your PC needs to know where the default gateway is because otherwise it wouldn't know where to send requests to get to the Internet. So now, how does your PC contact the DHCP server? Well, here's the process. You have two choices. You have static configuration and dynamic configuration. In the static configuration, a administrator or somebody with administrative rights has logged on to that PC and assigned it a specific IP number and subnet mask. Not only have they done that, but they also told that PC where the default gateway is, what the default gateway address is, and how to reach a DNS server. That's not too bad as long as you've only got a couple of PCs. But if you're like in my household, I think last time I counted, I have seven PCs. Uh, we have three smartphones, two laptops, and a bunch of tablets running around here. I don't want to have to go around configuring those all the time. I use DHCP, which is the dynamic method. What I did is I configured the, in this case, my cable modem to hand out uh, the IP address and IP configuration that I wanted. So the administrator configures the DHCP server to handle the assignment process. It automates it, makes it a whole lot easier just to deal with things. I can have equipment come and go, and I don't have to worry about it. So how does it work? Well, here's the typical DHCP process. The computer boots up. When it boots up, it knows its MAC address. I hope you know what your MAC at. I hope you understand what the MAC address is. That's your hardware address. It knows what its MAC address is, but it doesn't know what its IP address is. So it sends out a discovery packet. Basically, that discovery packet says, hey, DHCP, where are you? And who am I? And it sends along its MAC address. It sends that discovery out on a network broadcast so it sends it out to address 255.255.255.255 on UDP port 67. The DHCP server is listening for these discovery packets. It hears it, it reads it, and it responds. And it responds with an offer packet. The offer, con the offer contains the proposed IP address, subnet mask, default gateway, and usually the DNS server location. And basically what it says is, just like in that graphic there, it says, hey, I'm here, and you are 192.168.0.3 with a subnet mask of 255.255.255.0. 
And if I was to continue that out, it'll, I would also say that the default gateway would be 192.168.0.1, and the DNS server location would be the same. Now, if the P PC receives that offer and goes, oh, okay, so you want me to be 192.168.0.3? Okay, I can live with that. It responds actually with the request package. This is kind of silly, but it's it's saying thank you. I accept your response. I accept your packet. I acknowledge that you answered my request. And the DHCP server says, "Ah, oh, okay. I received your request package, and I acknowledge that. And you're done. You're set up." That was long-winded, but that's the way it works. So the PC sends the discovery packet on UDP port 67 to out the broadcast address, and the DHCP server responds, actually it responds back to the MAC address on UDP port 68, which the PC is listening to. So those are the ports that you need to remember. They're both UDP, and it's UDP 67 and 68. Now, <clears throat> what is the address scope? Well, the address scope in DHCP is the pool of IP addresses or the IP address range with the subnet mask that the administrator has configured into the DNS server to hand out. Uh, if you just went to your local electronic store and you bought, uh, actually it doesn't even have to be that, your ISP. Um, so you've got DSL or a cable modem, you know, Comcast or Frontier Communications sent it to you, you plugged it in, they will have already programmed in an address scope. Uh, I like to change that. I don't like using anybody's defaults. So I, I tend to go in and change those things just because I'm not a default kind of person. But the address scope is the pool of available IP addresses that can be handed out. Now there's also a thing called address reservation. Now address reservation are IP addresses that would fall within the IP address range that you don't want to hand out. Why wouldn't you want to hand those out? Well, you wouldn't want to hand out, say, your default gateway's IP address to a PC, because then everybody would get confused. Uh, Address reservations are actually addresses that DHCP will not hand out. And you get to plug those in. You get to configure those. Uh, and I do recommend that you change the defaults because everybody knows what the default defaults are. And if they don't necessarily know right off the top of their heads, they're easy to find. Um, one of the good things about address reservations and address scope is you get to configure those all from a central location, which makes it real easy. So now let's talk about leases. Each, each time the DHCP server hands out an IP address, it actually only loans it to that PC. It's actually on a lease. They are only loaned out for a specific amount of time. Now, you as the administrator of that piece of equipment can establish the length of time. You know, you might want to hand it out for 24 hours. You might want to hand it out for two days. Shoot, you might only want to hand it out for, for an hour. I don't, never done that. I probably wouldn't recommend it. But hey, you get to do that. Some of the options that you get to configure in DHCP, or the default gateway, DNS server locations. If you're using a, a time server, so that would be an NTP server. 
out there on the web. You can program in that location, program input that location into your DHCP setup um, so that everybody's operating off of their off at the same time, and there are a ton of other options. But the three that you need to know about are the default gateway. The three you need to know about are the default gateway, the DNS server, and time server addresses that you can input those into the DHCP server. Uh, Boy, I like how I wrote that. Uh, preferred IP configuration. Uh, PCs can have preferred IP addresses. As a matter of fact, they like to have preferred IP addresses. Your PC will remember which IP address it had in the past. So after it gets it the first time, you shut it down, you fire it back up again, it's going to say, hey, DHCP, where are you? I used to be 192.168.0.3. I would like to be that again, can I? And your DHCP server has the option of saying yes or no. It might have already handed out that address to somebody else. Uh, if you happen to have a lot of equipment in a very small IP pool, address pool, chances are it's already been handed out. Your DHCP server would say, yeah, I know you'd prefer to be that address, but you can't. You're going to be this this time. And what will happen is that will be what your PC will prefer the next time it boots up. Um, you as the administrator get to determine whether or not your DHCP server will honor those preferred requests or not. Uh, and there we have it. We have now gone through all of the exam objectives for the CompTIA N10-005 exam. Uh, we covered objectives 2.2 and 2.3, so we discussed installing and setting up and configuring a wireless network, and we talked about the uh, purpose and properties of DHCP.